Hello, I'm Dr. Noel Wagner, Saginaw Tuscola Medical Control Authority, and today we're going to talk about cardiac arrest, part two. Uh, we just put a video out uh, a couple weeks ago on cardiac arrest, and we got a few follow-up questions, so we're going to address those today. promise you it'll be much shorter than the last video. So number one, traumatic arrest. We talked about traumatic arrest a little bit. Um, we asked for a little bit more uh, clarity on what to do. Uh, essentially, the, the baseline premise is still the same. If you're going to work a traumatic arrest, you need to transport immediately to the hospital. Um, unlike medical arrest, the hospital has something that that patient needs. They need blood. They need a tube that we don't have. They need an OR. They need a surgeon. So staying on scene is, is completely futile uh, with a traumatic arrest. Make sure you're transporting. The specific question was the difference between penetrating and blunt. And what we used to say is that if it was a penetrating arrest that somebody witnessed alive, then we should transport to the hospital. So even if law enforcement gets on scene, find somebody who's in arrest from penetrating trauma, but they, they were had signs of life before that, we would transport them to the hospital and we still will. Um, blunt was a little bit more of a dismal prognosis. And if, we got on scene and they had already arrested, we, we, we would stop. If they arrested on us, we would consider stopping. Um, I think now that after looking at the literature a little bit more, um, there's a few things that are starting to percolate out um, that says we probably should be transporting those that arrest on us. Um, we're still gonna do all of the other things we would with traumatic arrest, consider decompression, make sure the airway is good, TXA. You probably do need to do fluid support also, um, although we, we like permissive hypotension in, in a trauma patient. Hypotension with a zero blood pressure is, is, is not where we want to be, so we will give fluids. Um, but blunt rest, blunt traumatic arrests that occur in front of us, we should still be transporting uh, just with all those interventions. So, so hopefully that clears that up, um, that uh, we want to lean towards transporting um, blunts as well as, as penetrating. Uh, second question was sodium bicarb. Uh, it was noticed that sodium bicarb is still being used. I'm not a fan of sodium bicarb in a routine uh, arrest. Um, uh, there's a fair number of people out there that differ uh, with the AHA on this recommendation. Um, there's science out there that shows that although we may be making the intercellular acidosis better in the blood, there's a possibility uh, that we're making the intracellular acidosis worse. When we started giving bicarb with arrests uh, back oh, many years ago, way before my time, um, you'd pop the two amps of bicarb and you'd give it. And we realized that as the molecules dissociate um, and we weren't ventilating properly, we, we could make the inter intracellular acidosis worse. So they then modified that to say we shouldn't be giving bicarb until we we're ventilating well. Um, again, there's those of us that have now taken it one step further and we think that we just shouldn't give bicarb at all. The number one way to address acidosis in a cardiac arrest is good compressions. Um, all of these patients that got taken to the hospital years ago and were found to be profoundly acidotic were acidotic because they were getting suboptimal manual CPR in the back of a moving ambulance, which we don't do anymore. So uh, if we're staying on scene uh, with a medical arrest, giving good quality CPR, the acidosis is going to be very manageable and bicarb is not necessary. Bicarb is really should only be used for a specific antidote. So for tricyclics, um, you can consider it as the second drug for hyperkalemia, um, calcium obviously being the first. Um, you can consider it for something specific like that, but generally speaking, just a general run of the mill, uh, cardiac arrest, not a fan of bicarb. It was also asked that it seemed like I have a tendency to want to do needle decompressions for respiratory induced cardiac arrest. Um, to clarify that a little bit, there's an old, there's an old uh, adage in medicine or emergency medicine uh, that an asthmatic should never die without a needle in their chest. And what that's alluding to is the fact that one of the causes of death in, in somebody with asthma um, can be a pneumothorax. Um, that can happen and when we start bagging on them, we can turn them into a tension pneumothorax um, and it can go downhill from there. So, uh, you know, somebody with asthma, which is a reversible condition, shouldn't die from something that's easily fixed. Now, it's not a high incidence of pneumothoraxes, but there's enough that you seriously want to consider that. Um, if I'm 
actually working the arrest, I always feel like I have a pretty good feel um, for when there definitely isn't a pneumothorax. Um, sometimes you have a feel for when there definitely is and you would decompress. Um, or if there's that in between, then, then I'll be more likely to do it. Uh, when you're talking to me over the phone or over the radio, it's a little bit harder for me to, to get that feel. And so we tend to lean a little bit more towards decompressing. Um, but again, you know, an asthmatic shouldn't die from a pneumothorax. Um, you can extrapolate that out to a COPD or which can get pneumothoraxes should not die from a pneumothorax. So that's why we have a tendency to be leaning towards wanting to decompress somebody with a respiratory cause. It's, it's low yield, but there's a potentially significant return on a, a very small subset of patients. Impedance threshold devices. We still have them, we're still using them, and there's still a lot of controversy on their use. Um, they were one of the uh, hottest commodities out there a few years back. Uh, the ROC study, ROC, Research Outcomes Consortium study, uh, looked at them, um, ultimately concluded that there wasn't a benefit. A uh, lot of discussion around that finding though. Um, far from definitive in a lot of people's minds. Um, there were some questions about how, how, how it was carried out. Um, and so we're really kind of left with unfinished, unfinished business um, uh, with impedance threshold devices, in, in my opinion. Uh, and there's other people out there that share that. So where does that put us today? Well, we still have them. Um, we can still use them. I think we probably still should be using them. There's no downside to using them. Um, and if you're going to use them, use them early. Uh, the theory is the impedance threshold device will lower your interthoracic pressure. It's a reverse peep valve. So instead of increasing your pressure, it will help decrease the pressure inside your chest. Um, they can be used with the bag valve mask, but you have to have a constant perfect seal with the bag valve mask, and that's very difficult to do. So generally, I'd recommend using an impedance threshold device on an ET tube, uh, an eye gel, a King airway, something, something along the lines where you have a, a, of a more secure uh, airway um, uh, uh, to work with for that, okay? Epinephrine, are we going to decrease our epinephrine? Well, yes and no. The, the specific question was, are we gonna decrease from a milligram to half a milligram as, as many systems or some systems are doing? Not yet. Um, I'm still looking at that one. I think that's probably a direction we're going to go to in the future uh, as far as the, uh, the dosage. Um, I think the amount of epi we're going to go down pretty soon. Uh, we used to have eight milligrams of pre-filled epi in the box. And then one day uh, everybody opened the box and there was five milligrams of pre-filled epi. That was intentional. Um, we did that on purpose. Um, we wanted less epi. Um, next time we do the drug box research, um, we're going to bump it down again. I don't know if we're gonna to go to three or four, uh, but after the next research, when you open the box and there's less epi in it, that's a hint. Um, that's all the epi we think that, that you need um, uh, to potentially get a good outcome. Uh, epi might give you more return of circulation, but the science is, uh, there's, there's really virtually no supporting science uh, that shows that epi gives better neurologic outcomes. So um, as far as the epi, I'm really, expecting people to use the pre-fields for the arrest. The two small vials of epi, those are for anaphylaxis or uh, some other use. I'm not expecting people to use the small vials. Um, uh, it's, just, it's just not logical to say, well, we're gonna use these five and then I expect you to pop open two more. If I wanted you to use seven, we would have seven in the box, okay? So those other two are for when we need epi in the one to 1,000 uh, dose, not in the, in the one to 10,000, okay? So for right now, five's the limit. Um, and very soon limit's going to be a little bit lower. That's okay. And then whenever, if we start looking at lower milligram dosages, um, we'll let everybody know so that we're all on the same page on that. And that was the, uh, the five questions that came forward. Hopefully that adds a little bit of clarity to our cardiac arrest videos. Uh, until next time, again, Dr. Noel Wagner, Saginaw Tuscola Medical Control Authority.